how to choose the most appropriate technology for my multimodal language learning environment. I deliberately say my multimodal language learning environment, meaning your language learning environment. That means immediately in the title that using a specific technology is not a question of being right or wrong. It all depends on the context. It depends on your goal. It depends on your personality, etc. There's no such thing as the good or bad technology. The most appropriate means that depending on your context. So you cannot evaluate a colleague who is using this or that technology. It's not about comparing Zoom to Teams or uh, uh, talking about the, the effect the learning effect of specific features of specific technologies. It's all not about that. And this is what I'm going to try to explain uh, today. OK, looking back, uh, who am I to say these things? Well, I have been a language learner since since 58. That means that was the day I was born, like all of you. Language teacher since 1980. So that's uh, quite a long time. And a call developer and researcher since 86. And I have been editor in chief of Computer Assisted Language Learning since 2002. And I've written some, and I give you, will give you these references at yet again, two editorials that may explain more my position and my views on the role of technology and certainly on the publication process. Uh, I, I think many of you might be interested in that. When I look back, uh, well, I have learned a lot, I must say. But I have learned, I must say that I was just discussing this topic with my colleague who introduced me. Um, when COVID arrived in, in, in Europe, then teachers had to change in two days time, I remember that very well, uh, completely from face-to-face uh, -face teaching to online teaching, what you experience uh, yourselves. But my view was that in these two days here in Europe, certainly in Flanders, <clears throat> Um, teachers just took any technology and said, well, let's look at it for 15 minutes and let's start working with it. So they felt free, they felt autonomous. No one was telling them what to do. And I saw a huge explosion of initiatives of new ways of teaching, of new technologies. So there was more change than in the 40 years, 40 since 80. Uh, 40 years, I had been trying to convince teachers to use technology for a specific uh, reason. So then I saw it's not about technology. It's about attitude, teachers' attitude based on insight, on psychological factors. This is what I learned from COVID. Now, what, 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 why do I look amused? This is why, as editor of journal, I suddenly received a huge amount of, of articles with COVID and pandemic in the title. People started to write about COVID and I rejected all of these articles. Why? Because you, you can't have, it was impossible that you've made some kind of decent research project uh, already two months after the start of, of, of the pandemic and write about the lessons. It was pure speculation. And the same thing happens uh, with uh, chat GPT. Now, all the articles coming in on chat GPT. Let's talk about the metaverse. Uh, people who have been working with virtual uh, working and teaching environments know that this is not a good idea. You can use it in cases as a, an emergency solution, in cases where um, physical contact is impossible. But we all know that that cannot be the normal way of meeting and working together. So I'm very critical about all these things. And certainly when you start writing about a bit without knowing all about the limitations and the affordances. ChatGPT, as a computational linguist, we know that these routines all exist since the 80s. Like with robotics, people say, oh, look at the power, power of artificial intelligence. That's nothing has changed since the 80s. That means that the only difference as far as robotics is concerned is in the power of the mini motors is in the processing speed of the processors, is in the, the data and the computation speed, et cetera. Same thing for chat GPT. What, is, what does it make like making artificial paintings in the style of Dali, whatever? Well, producing writings in a certain style about a certain topic is very predictable. And as a neural network, you can, just it's because you has you have 
huge amounts of data that the difference is there. This is with the chat box, this is with other forms of artificial intelligence, not much intelligence, a lot of data, and that's the big difference. What I need, what I would need, and this is why I say there is not really useful artificial intelligence in my view for the moment, is, well, when I have to choose a favorite meal in some kind of website, the, the, this site is as stupid as can be because it does not remember what my preferences are or does not guess what my preference, it can't predict my preferences. Or you, I, I, have, I hope you have the same experience once you try to prepare a trip uh, to a certain country, you have to choose your flight, your hotels, etc., etc. This is a huge effort and that makes me always very angry that these systems are as stupid as can be, excuse, excuse me for, the, for this word. Uh, talking about, uh, about language teaching, well, the, the most crucial example is simple. As long as we do not have systems that can provide automated individualized feedback on what has happened in exercises and in tasks, in the language learning process, there is no artificial intelligence. So let us make it very clear. All that, what I see, and I'm a little critical here, but I know there's some very exciting systems, but is dancing bearware, what Alan Cooper da called dancing bearware. That means that people are impressed with some features and forget, really, and that's the worst thing, forget about what they really need and expect from technology. So do you know why you're using which technology? So that's my question for you. If you reflect on why do I use a certain technology in my teaching? Well, I think you probably think you do. And you do. I mean, you do know why I think so. But what I am trying to say today is that you can broaden your horizon a little bit and make more justifiable choices. That means that you can justify your choice for yourself. And this is what I try to do. Generate a more rewarding effect for yourself that you have this feeling of um, results, of competence and happiness in what you do. And more importantly, consider that real research. I mean, real research is not just writing about COVID or chat GPT, but what you are trying with technology and why you have tried what you're trying to do. Now, what I teach my students is that there are, in fact, uh, 10 possible reasons for using technology. And I categorize them in four main categories, technology, pedagogy, psychology, and design. And I show this because I always tell them as well, there is no right or wrong reason. Often in literature, you, you will find uh, something like, well, a technology-driven approach is not okay then I say, why wouldn't you just test a new technology like ChatGPT with your students and involve them in the process of evaluating the thing? So you, the reason for using it is because the technology is there and it's something new and you just want to explore it. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you're honest about what you're doing and why, that's the, that's the problem. Okay. Let's go very quickly through these. Reasons. You can read this. Well, the presence means, well, technology might be there. So you just at school or at the, in your institution. So you just use it. The pressure, peer pressure, you know all about that. Your superiors, colleagues, or even the students put you under pressure to use certain technology. Some features, attractive features of a certain technology like augmented reality, virtual reality. Uh, you might think, well, that would be nice to try it. Why not? Then you have what I call the pedagogy or the pedagogical reasons for using technology. Practice, that means that as a teacher, you feel a certain functionality that you need to do your job better as a teacher, like peer evaluation, synchronous collaborative writing and so on. Other people will rely on some big theory. You will apply certain educational models such as social constructivism, activity theory, and derive a demand from, for technology from that, like co-construction tools. Very interesting are the attributes. Certain characteristics of the technology have a clear effect on the learning and retention process, what Mayer has proven in a lot of literature on the cognitive model, on his cognitive multimedia model. Um, 
more importantly, in my view, is psychological reasons for using technology. And I categorize them in three reasons. Acceptance. So certain technologies have high mental acceptability, and there you can use the technology acceptance model later on, evolved in a more complex model like UT, AUT, something like that. Affordances is, is the key word, in my view. Certain technology clearly help us achieve our personal goal. Affordance is defined as the extent to which uh, technologies can help us to realize our personal goals. And motivation. Technology should mainly be aimed at increasing identification and self-regulation, what is said in self-determination theory. The last category is design, and that's where I'm going to talk about today, that the demand for technology arises from the design of an optimal learning environment as a final step in the design process. That means that uh, it's just one of the ways to, to use or to justify the use of technology is saying, listen, I'm not going to start with technology. I'm going to start with the design, methodological design of my learning environment. And there I will use both psychological and pedagogical reasons for trying to make the most optimal learning environment. And I'm not saying that perfect learning environments do not exist, not simply because they depend on context, but also because you can only try and we do not know enough. How do we do that? Then? What is design? Why is this an important question for the developers and users? Teachers should become designers. Yes, but what is design exactly? Very important is that you can talk about, this is what happens a lot when we talk about design. People always fall back on features of, of technology, on specific features of the learning environment. Oh, a good learning environment should contain this or that feature. No, we should not be discussing on that level. We should talk about design as a process. That means that, and that's what's exciting in my job, when people ask me to go and evaluate a certain a specific learning environment all over the world, then what I try to do is not evaluate features, tick the boxes, uh, no, and that's what they often expect from me. I try to do the same process and say, if I were a teacher here, what would, and, and if I apply a methodological design process, then what would be the result? I do not know the result in advance. And this is a very important thing to say. People should forget that there's something as the uh, ultimate uh, quality of um, design. Design, in my view, is three A's. First of all, we need to apply theories, models, and principles. Respect the theory. Secondly, uh, what I said already, it's about adapting to the specific context of learner and teacher. So it's always context dependency of a good design. And third, what I also said, we are not never sure. There's not no knowledge, not enough knowledge available to make the perfect learning environment. We can only try, we should apply what we know, then make something good, but at the same time realize it's not perfect yet. And then it's very important to build in something that we can learn, try always something new and uh, learn the lessons. Said in a more scholarly academic way, the learning environment to be designed will always be a hypothetical approximation in a cyclic and iterative approach of the optimal solution. So it's a gradual process of clarification. And if we tell teachers that, that is, takes the pressure off their shoulders, they put them in a more autonomous, uh, competent place where they feel better if you tell them, okay, you can design your own learning environment, just follow these steps. We know it will not be perfect, but every year you will make a, a, a small change and you will learn from that what is working or not in your case. Now, when I teach uh, instructional design, normally I would have to teach all these instructional idea models. And this is the problem. Where you do you start? What is useful? Uh, are these models valid? Are they been validated? Uh, are they based on research or just some position statement? Some models are a little bit outdated. Uh, some are very young. Some you recognize are self-determination theory, so it's not really a, an instructional design model, but a very useful psychological theory. Now, I call my model, which is a little bit the synthesis of what I've learned in my life, in my career, 
Uh, what I said about this approximation, cyclic iterative approach about trying to do better every time according to your context, taking into account theory and adapt to the context. I uh, Only after a couple of years, after almost 20 years, I discovered a word that would clearly reflect what I tried to say, and this is engineering. And um, I started from the idea that education is never perfect. It will always be, what we say, laden possible, the art of the possible, because there's simply not enough knowledge available in terms of substantiated findings, which could enable us to improve education, solve problems or design solutions in a systematic, methodological or justifiable way. What Piaget said, l'intelligence n'est pas ce qu'on sait, mais ce qu'on fait quand on ne sait pas. Intelligence is not what you know, but what you do when you do not know. And this is beautiful for education. We need to tell teachers that idea. And then I read in an earlier publication first, but then afterwards by Billy Van Coyne, definition of the engineering method. It's the first uh, uh, person that ever um, defined engineering in this way, very interesting definition. By the engineering method, I mean the strategy for causing the best change in a poorly understood or uncertain situation within the available resources. Engineering is not about mathematics. It's not immediately about technology. It's about knowledge, yes, but engineering is doing something where you do not know in advance. You do not have enough knowledge whether it's going to work or not. You can only work with the best possible hypothesis and learn from that. So this reflects my view on, on education perfectly. So I called it educational engineering. That means strategy to apply when not enough knowledge is available. You apply an iterative cyclic instructional design model, in which is staged, methodological. And you go through analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. Okay, you will say it's an ADI model. It means that's too systematic, that's waterfall, not necessarily, because you have these real world loops, and that's the difference with other ADI models. In my, my instructional design model says that you should not only prototype something and go back to your users. The best use uh, uh, test is to do it in reality. That means in a real course, you, you apply some change and you expect something to, to happen. And you, you, you make a new design according to that result. You formulate and validate hypothesis. That means that uh, in order to do these uh, correctly, then you have to formulate a hypothesis and say, well, this year, next year, I will try to increase autonomy, for instance, a little bit and see what happens. But I need to formulate in advance what I expect. So the validation of your hypothesis is the comparison between what happened, what you observed, and what you expected. The implications for teachers are, first of all, no Sunday evening syndrome or less. What I call Sunday evening syndrome is simply the feeling that you have as a teacher when you have to teach on Monday, six hours, Tuesday, uh, seven hours, like I have done during six years in secondary education. This is an awful feeling because why? Because you have the feeling, this feeling that your lessons are never prepared well enough. And we always have that feeling as teachers. Now, if you apply this model, then you simply know, know by definition it is never good enough, and I accept that, but I have a plan, I have a method, so the best possible way to advance is to apply this model. Beautiful is also that you can uh, involve the learners in your design when you're reflecting about what should change, you can discuss it with your students, and you also have this method, I will talk about it in a minute. And you can convert your daily teaching as a research. And this is an interesting uh, point that you can teach a course for a year, change it the year after, formulate your hypothesis and say, listen, this is what I learned about my design process. This is interesting. This is my model. So you go through analysis, you conceptualize, you specify, you prototype, you develop implement and evaluation, and you simply do it in reality. You check again on theory, you check again with technology, and you go back to your analysis design again. So this every year. The problem here is with this model, I will admit it. Uh, when In my first year as a teacher of French, I had the extreme luck. I was so lucky that I had four parallel classes. So I could teach 
a topic the first hour and then immediately go to the next class and teach exactly the same. And within one week, I saw that the way I was teaching was, or the quality of the teaching was increasing. My lesson became better and better and better, but immediately within one week. The problem here with this model, and I apply, I have been applying it to my own course, is that I have to wait, I have to wait one year to see if I teach it once a year, or uh, better would be twice, but in this case of instructional design, I, I, I was teaching it once a year, so I, I needed to write down everything I learned in order to formulate a new hypothesis in the next academic year. But this is a very slow process. This only after 13 years of teaching the course that I could say that there was considerable progress and not in one or two years time. So this is a little bit of, of, of a problem. This model is based basically on four main hypotheses. That means that everyone, all teachers, you as well, all, all you participants should become or consider yourself designers. But then, oh, engineers better, educational engineers, that means that you build your own hypotheses. Now I have made my own hypotheses in my work, and I hope you will able to build your own. Why do I call them paradigm shifts? Well, because these are the four most important hypotheses of my life that go against mainstream thinking. There's a problem. The, my first point is, the ecological paradigm shift is that no technology carries an inherent measurable and generalizable effect on learning. This targeted effect can only come from the learning environment as an ecology. So I'm not the only one to say that. The ecological approach by Brunner, Frenner, etc. So it's not only my view, it's, it's, it's checked with literature. Um, so what we should stop doing is trying to measure the effect of technology, completely useless. Secondly, when we say that the learning effect can only come from an ecology, from the learning environment, this process-oriented paradigm shift says that this eventual learning effect of the learning environment is proportional to the designness of the learning environment. Now, I don't know if I invented this word designness, but what I mean with designness is it's the extent to which a learning environment has been designed in a methodological way, the designness. So, Learning effect depends on the total learning. Uh, the learning effect depends on the total learning environment, on the extent to which it has been designed in a methodological way. And then, very important paradigm shift is the demand or the pull paradigm shift. That means that we should forget that technology is not this thing that has an effect on our brain. We should design first. If we design first, and this is my biggest hypothesis. If we design a learning environment, then we will create the demand for specific, I would not say immediately technology, but certainly functionalities. That means that if you try to think about the most powerful, the most appropriate learning environment, that you will say in the end, well, what I would need is something for co-construction, for synchronous collaborative writing, for peer evaluation you will be able, without thinking if these technologies exist or not, uh, I will give examples uh, at the end. And this is a very beautiful thing. It's not, well, design is a big word, but simply if you all would adopt the same reasoning of, we do not start with technology, we end with technology. We start with psychology and then go through pedagogy and end with demand specification of the technology we need. And that will be different in every situation. I already said it. The psychological paradigm shift is perhaps the most important one. Because in literature, well, colleagues worldwide always say, it's not, well, it's not technology, it's pedagogy first. They say, yeah, I agree, but it's something that comes first. Because even with the best possible pedagogical didactic approach, your learning environment can fail completely if you do not respect some basic psychological aspects. And I think you know that, but this is my point. Go back to basics of psychology. My point is focus on personal goals is a more efficient way to realize pedagogical goals. We all start with pedagogical goals. And as a teacher of French, I have all uh, cases of less motivation. I have also tried to convince my students that French was important, that France was beautiful, and this and, and interesting, and this and that. But in case of less motivation, that was kind of counterproductive even. 
So what I have learned, and this is a long story, and you can read about it in this article I have written in 2010 already about the elicitation of language learners' personal goals as design concept. And it's exciting. This is my lifelong lesson that I learned. It's if you succeed in detecting personal goals and see where they conflict with pedagogical goals, then you have an excellent starting point for design. Now, this is not only what I learned from experience and during my life, but I checked it with literature. And then what I also teach, I teach sometimes more psychology because I'm not a psychologist, I repeat it. Uh, but very interesting models and theories, you see them here listed. Um, if you read about it and you try to get inspired, no theories should be applied as such. But it, one thing that always comes back in psychology, it's about effort and reward ratio. People will identify themselves or accept, mentally accept something, if there is some time, something of reward, be it competence, autonomy, relatedness. And Desi and Raina, or Raina and Desi presented this because there's no such thing as motivated or not motivated. It's not black and white. Desi and Ryan defined seven or six levels of motivation. You can make your own scale if you want. But this is very beautiful to see. It's not about making all your students uh, intrinsically motivated. My view is, if you start beginning of the year with a house curve of uh, when you spread your population on all these levels, if you could, could move up your population just one level by the end of the year, you would already be very happy. And this is a very nice view, very interesting thing to look at. Now, if you look at the psychological level in, in, in design, then you, you would have to take into account on the universal level, self-determination theory. That means that these are three competence related as autonomy are three universal innate per, uh, psychological goals that according to that theory are true for all people in the world. On the individual level, on the, on the other hand, we have the L2 self model where Daniel Schroeder said, well, there's something like the ideal self and the auto self and the com these conflicts sometimes very interesting to read, but this model is on the individual level. That means that, yes, all our auto selves and ideal self images are different according to our individual. Now, when we design learning environments, well, we cannot say, okay, we just stick to the universal thing so that we would end up eventually with all the same learning environments. We cannot design for individuals because we deal with large groups. So my theory, the personal goal theory, comes on the local level. That means that I developed it as a model for designing for groups where you assume that there are some learning types, uh, personas. Uh, you can give them a name if you want. Uh, but OK, this is the, uh, my personal goal theory is that personal, the focus on pedagogical goals is counterproductive in context with less motivation. So this is my our natural reaction as a teacher, less motivation, so I will insist on these pedagogical goals. The key is to detect where personal goals conflict with pedagogical goals. That exactly is the starting point for design, uh, should be the reconciling hypothesis. So if you identify the personal goal, and what can a personal goal be? Well, I want more respect, I want more relatedness, I want more support, uh, I want more freedom. Those are personal goals. And if they conflict with the way that you organize your course, um, that is the reason why there is no identification, there is no motivation in the end, no self-regulation. Now, personal goals are subconscious course-related religions that are hypothetical factor. We are not sure, I'm not a psychologist, but I have, as a designer, I have to assume uh, these factors that stimulate or hinder the learning process. Now, how do I elicit, and this is, described in detail in the article I gave the reference for. Uh, I organized a focus group just one hour. And my course, my questions are, which problems do you have with this course? When you think about these problems, you feel, and this is a very difficult question because students have problems finding the correct word about how they feel. This is already very interesting. Um, you feel because you, and then it takes 20 minutes for them to discover that they have negative feelings because they want something. And to have negative feeling, feelings is a beautiful thing, is a good thing. Because if it conflicts with something, um, it gives 
it, it's a sign of positive volitions. Um, and this is a very special technique because you also have the appreciative inquiry technique in literature about research methods. Uh, it's not just about uh, asking about which problems are so to provide solutions. The problems are just a layer. You go under that layer towards the negative feelings and under the negative feelings are positive visions. People have negative feelings because they want something. The most beautiful feeling, and if you do this focus group, you will have, for instance, if you ask your students in Asia and Hong Kong, perhaps not so <laughs> open about their feelings, but in most cases in Europe or in Belgium, students will say, I feel frustrated. And then I tell them, oh, that's beautiful. And then I'm surprised. Yeah, because you can only be frustrated or your reaction is I'm frustrated, or I say, you say, I don't care. What's the difference? If you're frustrated, it means that you want absolutely something, but you're unable to realize it. So you can focus on the limit, limiting factors, but you can also focus on the positive uh, volition. Now I've described this in this article, you can have, have this PowerPoint in the end and it's being recorded. So I hope that you will read this, it's, it's not a very, uh, difficult theoretical article. It's more anecdotal. That means that I described how I de de developed this model, this theory, this technique over over the years. But it's amazing. If you apply it, you will discover, and also the students for themselves, the very interesting, very interesting exercise. And even in the language learning process, it's a very interesting task or exercise type to do. It's just ask themselves to explain that. Now, in a more complex form, if people ask me worldwide to analyze their learning environment, then this is the model I apply. I hope you can read it, but I will explain it very quickly. That means that teachers, for teachers, it, it's not only about learners, the conflict between the pedagogical goal, what they must and what they want. For teachers, the same thing. And it should, we should start from there. As a teacher of French, you have your pedagogical goals to realize. As a teacher of instructional design, in my view, I know and I hear in one ear what university and what other people expect from me. On the other hand, in my other ear, I hear myself and I say, well, as a teacher, I'd rather be this kind of this kind of teacher and I don't like this content or that evaluation type. So there's this conflict in my mind constantly. Uh, in my case of instructional design, for instance, what students expect from me is that they have a clear text to study for the exam and they expect questions about the text. Um, this is uh, strange because the, the, my purpose is to make, to be a master chef and to have this master course in instructional design and to make, to make them master chefs themselves. And they have a psychological problem with that because it's not clear enough. So their attitude, in my view, that's my conflict in my mind. How can I, with my design of language learning, and uh, it's not language learning, it's instructional design, whatever. But how can I, in my design, reconcile, first of all, that conflict in my mind as a teacher? Then if I find a compromise, if I succeed in formulating hypothesis for reconciling this conflict, then that becomes the pedagogical goal for the learner. It's my course design, it's my course description. The problem is with course descriptions that in my case, I have to finish them by end of May or June and the academic year starts again in September. So how can I possibly adapt to my students? And they are each year, they're different each year. So I am unable as a designer to adapt well enough to my students, and I think you might have the same problem. Now, the most important stage is here. That means that the conflict between what learners want and what they have to do in your view, as I said, that was. Now, how do we define what teachers must do, what learners must do, and what teachers want to do, and what learners, and what learners want to do? On the left, you see, well, the policy on national level, regional level, and you have your curriculum profile, degree of freedom for teaching and learning. the literature, about pedagogy, education sciences, didactic, domain specific, data and content technology, and also reverse engineering. On the right hand side, you have teacher analysis, literature, learner analysis, means that you can analyze all the teacher characteristics. The literature is full of learner characteristics, which, can, which are important. 
uh, you should do all, all that in a systematic analysis. That means that if people uh, do, they want to ask me to design a specific uh, something, uh, okay. Um, but what I said, I do not evaluate learning environments on feature, but this is the reasoning I will apply. I, I apply. Very important is that you see at the bottom, the, learn, the resulting learning environment, when I specify it, I specify the pedagogical layer, I specify the component, the architecture, and only in the last step, I define not, not even directly the technology, um, etc. This is very important to see. Now, what I said about the pedagogical specification, this is the multimodal learning environment. This is what I call a multimodal learning environment. It means that uh, what we learned in the, in the pandemic is that our education is still too instruction based, so that we have to spread it more over autonomous learning, collaborative learning, coaching, and instruction. And then, if you define this as activity, activation, feedback, and evaluation, you get 16, this beautiful scheme, you get 16 possible learning and instruction activities. Um, and in design, it's about choosing, not using them all, but choosing for you the most appropriate learning activity. So the question about which is the most appropriate technology is secondary to the question, which is the most appropriate learning and instruction activity that I can apply. This is the core of design, is the choice of these activities based on psychological reasons, being which of these activities can best help to reconcile the conflict of goals between personal goals and pedagogical goals. Only afterwards, we are going to decide, will we do this face-to-face, -face, remote, synchronous or asynchronously, in cohort or not, individually or collaboratively? That's the second architectural specification. Now, finally, the technological layer is, so what I said is we have to define the architecture based on the pedagogical definitions, selection, your choice. Then you have to say, how are we going to do that? And then as a last step, we have the choice of technology. So my definition, very important, <clears throat> of the added value, of the appropriateness, let's say, of the technology, is the match between the requirements of the learning environment and the affordances of that technology. So that is my definition. That means that if you define the specify the requirements of the learning environment, which is the normal last stage of design, you end with formulating what you need, not immediately towards technology, but as a functionality, as a functionality. So you end up with saying, what I would need is some something we need that students can should be able to do this or that. Now the word affordance, I repeat, is the perceived possible contribution to goal realization. That's the official definition. I do not say explicitly it's about powerful features of technology, technological features or other features. It's about when you look at the technology, you have this immediate perception of this technology will help me or not. And this is why the word affordance is very important. Now, this everything is in this short formula. The appropriateness of technology is the match between the requirements, the question, the demand, and the offer being the affordances of technology. And everything is in there because the requirements, this is design. Affordance is the psychological side, is the goal realization. Beautiful. This makes me uh, excited about yeah, of course, it goes against mainstream thinking of this magical effect of technology on the brain of our children, which is not absolutely not the case. Okay, going very quickly because time is, uh, I only have nine minutes, if I'm correct. Um, well, I create my own multimodal environment. I will, I hope you will do the same. This is a little bit my uh, different from your from your multimodal learning environment. This is beautiful that if we have the same design process, exactly the same, this is why my research is on the process level, then we all end up with polymorphous results. If you apply this model to your environment, you will end up with a different um, learning environment. So 
here I, this is simply an example of how I distribute uh, my uh, learning and teaching uh, over these autonomous learning, collaborative learning, coaching and instruction, where my colleagues sometimes have only on <clears throat> only one evaluation figure, me meaning the written exam. I have something like 25 evaluation criteria, like every case assignment, tasks, um, they have an individual assignment, group assignments, and then also a written exam. They have peer evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes, I think, my evaluation um, uh, much more objective and justifiable. While you have all the same instruction modalities, what designing means not uh, we are to going to flip, I hate the word, it's wrong, to blend, it's wrong. Um, what you do is decide, what are you going to do face-to-face? What are you going to do remotely and what are you going to do in a hybrid mode? A hybrid mode, meaning that you're doing both at the same time. You teach both to face-to-face -to -face students as to remote students, which are very difficult, very complex way of teaching. I promise to give some examples. Well, I have been developing in the early 80s, mainly drill, what they call, what the critics, critics call the drill and practice materials. But we were really the first to flip activities, meaning by, by providing um, programs of verb conjugation in French vocabulary, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it was drill and practice. But if students could use these programs at home, then the teacher in the classroom got more time for the real uh, higher level order activities like conversation analysis uh, and intercultural communication. So you cannot isolate the added value of drill and practice and say, what I mean is vocabulary training materials, exercises, simple exercises with feedback that can be intelligent analysis of feedback, like I said in the beginning. The usefulness of drill and practice materials depends on the rest of the learning environment. So we cannot say something about how useful or how bad they are for our minds. In the beginning, in the 80s and 90s, that was awful. That was really awful. Awesome. Um, okay, I won't go irritate myself. <clears throat> Another concrete example I've been confronted with is the use of simultaneous subtitling or translation tools. Why I'm giving this example? Because uh, <clears throat> in Belgium, we have uh, many immigrants uh, from Ukraine, for instance, who have to learn very quickly our language and integrate as quickly in classical education. Normally, they get separate track uh, where they get uh, try kind of courses to get uh, on the level required to enter regular education. Now, some people were, want to expedite and uh, speed up the process. And this is why I thought, well, if you analyze it and design a learning environment where you would integrate these immigrants, children, in regular classrooms, then we would need, and this is the demand-driven approach, it would be useful to have uh, at, uh, on your computer or smartphone, uh, subtitling or translation tool. One year ago, two years ago, that was simply unconceivable. You can formulate that demand, but if the technology is not there, now the technology is there, it's not perfect, but it will allow students to simply follow what the teacher is saying in our mother tongue, in our mother tongue, and they can have or that thing translated, the text or what they're saying, translated or subtitled in their own language or in the, in the target language so that, subtitled in the target language in our language so that they learn a lot. Use of augmented reality, it's, it's very clear. It depends on, 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 on the course you're teaching. Uh, it, it depends on the available material. It can be extremely useful, but there's again, no such thing as um, it has a universal effect on learning. Games and gamification, the eternal discussion, no, I will tell you, no, games do not have a positive effect on learning. Absolutely not. Uh, they are detrimental to the, the real skills that, that things need. Oh, they will say, yeah, but they, they, they become more, they're better at problem solving. Yes, yes, there are some advantages, but um, there's a huge danger, but not if games and gamification activities are used when they are needed in a learning environment. And there they can play a huge role. And the main problem I see is that these games or gamification activities are not well integrated in a design. The teachers think, well, 
uh, I will not change a lot about my design, but I will use a game now and then, so that will motivate the learners. No, there's not, no model behind it. But if you design a learning environment and say, yes, based on my analysis, it would be interesting to challenge the kids and to work them together to make them interact on a challenge, blah, 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 and the reward would be this or that. And then you choose a, a game that corresponds to your demand, then you will see that that has an effect. I recently read a very interesting submission about robots and tangible objects. And this is quite interesting because in the language learning and teaching process, these robots, okay, it's not about replacing teachers with robots, not about that. It's about integrating robots in tasks, in saying, okay, uh, to students do something with a robot, make the robot execute a task. And that can be done in a specific language. But uh, it's, um, it's not only about internet of things, but going back to tangible objects that we formulate uh, or, or that we design research on tangible objects in the language learning process, I think this is beautiful because it reflects if the result of your design is that you need activities and tasks where the students and pupils go back to the use of tangible objects and even, I would say, tangible humans. This is my problem with the metaverse. It will never work. Um, okay. I said in the beginning, I will conclude with that idea. Design as research, it's not about the defect of product features, but about the process. It's about a formulate, to formulate a hypothesis to be validated. And the validation consists in comparing the actual result with the expected result. In my view, the major effect comes from accurate identification of personal goals, and it's described in the article that I gave. So first psychology, then pedagogy, then technology. Formulating your learning environment as a hypothesis to be validated is fun. Involving your students in the process is also fun. So I repeat, I have written uh, two articles for people, uh, two editorials for people who are interested in this kind of research or in my views on uh, research and call in general. It gives useful advice on how to do your research and how to publish and how to submit your research to journals. And I will end if one minute, with my usual do's and don'ts. This is what I gave, <laughs> always gave the do's and don'ts. Don't focus on the product, focus on the process. Do not focus exclusively on the instruction process, but focus on the design process first. Do not focus only on instruction, but also on the other forms of activities. Uh, do not put pedagogy first, put psychology first. Do not focus on discrete isolated elements, but on holistic ecological approach. Do not focus on emergency remote teaching. That was suddenly uh, the, the key word. But focus simply on the multimodal learning. Do not focus on COVID-related issues. Focus on the method, not a problem. Do not focus on evaluating learning environments, but evaluate the reasoning behind the design. Do not apply theory, models, and frameworks as such, but get inspired by relevant aspects of theories, models, and frameworks. Do not use perceived terms like flipping and blending uh, perfunctory names, but explain why you mentioned the term or a name. Exactly, it's 450 in your case. And so my question is, do you have any questions?